Hello, my name is Travis Monk. This is one of a series of videos involving evolution and classification. In this video, I will elaborate upon the major forms of evidence for evolution. Homologous features, shown in this picture, analogous features, vestigial structures, embryonic development, and similarities in macromolecules will all be topics discussed in this video. Perhaps one of the most objective and one of the best evidences for the evolutionary relationships between organisms involve similarities of their macromolecules, that is, their DNA, their RNA, and their proteins. While mice and humans may not look very similar, they are very genetically comparable. Not only do we possess the same genes, coding for the same proteins, but these proteins are often absolutely identical, or differing only by a single amino acid. Unicellular yeast are more than a quarter similar to humans. An explanation for these similarities between these very different organisms is that at one point they shared a common ancestor. The more similarity between individuals, the more recent that they shared some common ancestor. Homologous structures are those that possess a similar structure but a different function. In the picture to the right, all organisms have the same bones, a radius, an ulna, metacarpals, a humerus, but they serve very different functions flying, swimming, walking. Homologous features suggest that these organisms shared a common ancestor. Why would organisms possess the same structures for such different functions unless they were adapted for different purposes over a considerable amount of time? Analogous features serve similar functions but are structurally different. Bats, birds, and insects all have wings that are used for flying, but they are very differently structured. Evolution explains that these traits were adapted separately, but for similar purposes. Organisms that share analogous structures are often very unrelated to one another genetically, even though they might look the same. If you were to look at the embryos of different organisms, fish, reptiles, birds, humans, at the same level of development, you would find that they contain similar structures. Many of these structures are not even found in the fully developed form of these organisms. This picture illustrates gill slits and tails in human embryos, for example. This too supports common ancestry of very different organisms. This evidence is listed almost last, as there's been some controversy involving similarities in embryological development. When illustrations were first made to demonstrate these similarities, critics suggested that the illustrations were doctored to look a little too similar. The controversy does not, however, dismiss the evidence for evolution still provides an excellent example. Vestigial structures are parts that have no known or specific function for an organism. Tailbones in humans, humans don't have tails, nipples for males, males don't feed babies, and the human appendix and tonsils are commonly cited as vestigial structures. In addition, the wings of beetles that are unable to fly, as shown in the picture to the right, and the pelvic bones of a snake would provide other non-human examples. When organisms adapt to new environments, there may be certain characteristics or structures that are no longer required. If the ancestors of this beetle flew, the wings might have had a real purpose. If this beetle's ancestors moved to a location where flying no longer provided an advantage, or there was some disadvantage, they may no longer be used. They may have become vestigial structures. There are many misconceptions, and again some controversies involving vestigial structures, one is just because we don't understand the function of an organ at a particular time, tonsils, for example, kill many things that cause disease that enter your mouth, doesn't mean that they're useless. If you can survive without something, for example, your tonsils, your appendix, or your left arm, uh, that doesn't mean that it's vestigial. Their erroneous description of non-vestigial structures as being vestigial makes this a little bit more difficult to use as an evidence for evolution. While the fossil record, biochemical similarities, and anatomical structures can be used to compare two organisms and see how similar they are, there are excellent observable examples of evolution in action, providing, in my example at least, the best evidence for the process. The first such example involves the peppered moth. Some peppered moths are light colored, shown most clearly on the right, while others are dark colored, as best shown on the left. When the environment changed for the peppered moths, and later changed back, the peppered moth that best blended into the environment, you can hardly see the white peppered moth on the left or the black peppered moth on the right, 
became more and more common in the population. There is a tremendous amount of information that's available on this topic. Another excellent and observable evidence for evolution involves antibiotic resistance in bacteria. In the general bacterial population, very few individuals show antibiotic resistance, exhibited in stage 1 on the left. If you treat all these bacteria with antibiotics, most bacteria die off. Pretty much all of them do, except for the ones that have some natural antibiotic resistance. The survivors, however, can reproduce and increase their number, their frequency within the population. With repeated exposure to antibiotics, you eventually end up with a population that's highly resistant to antibiotics. The frequency of antibiotic resistance trait has changed, again constituting evolution. That is the end of this video, introducing different forms of evidence for evolution. If you are interested in learning more about evolution, classification, or any other themes of biology, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you.